Father God, we thank you. God, we glorify you. God, we are in you today. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just ask that you arrest this atmosphere. God, that your praise and worship was bring forth and let it be a sweet smelling. Savior, all, all, all unto you, O oh God. God, that you would just get the glory out of this worship service today. God, that you would get the praise out of this worship today, God. God, because we know that you didn't have to wake us up this morning, but we thank God that you did. God, we know you to be God and God alone. God, we know you to be a sovereign God. We know you to be our safety, our provider, our, our, the lover of our soul. God, we thank you. And right now, Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Dwell among us today. God, allow your presence to just sweep through this atmosphere in the name of Jesus. And God, we praise you. God, we worship you. God, we magnify you. God, we love you. God, we adore you. God, there's nobody like you. God, you're worthy of all of our praise. For you're the reason that we live, move, and have our being. God, without you, we are nothing. So God, we usher up this praise and worship to you, God, and we thank you for it. It is in Jesus' name that we do pray and give thanks. And the people of God said, amen. 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 Hallelujah. How many of us know the Lord to be our provider? How many of you know that he promised to take care of us? The Bible says he's never seen a righteous forsaken nor seed begging for bread. So I thank God that God takes care of us. Hallelujah. Come on, put your hands together. Let's join in with this praise and worship. Jesus! 
compliment of him taking care of us and him providing for us because we're sitting in this building today worshiping on one accord collectively. Amen. Amen. Somebody holler, God is good. Yes, he is. He is good. He is better than good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank God this morning. Amen. Good morning, Second Baptist. Amen. Say a little louder for the cheap seats. Good morning, Second Baptist. Amen. I was sitting down there and I was just like, you know, God is so good that when they were singing the song, it said, oh, how wonderful it is. And oh, how not marvelous, but marvelous. That's how you know God is good. But they didn't say marvelous. They said marvelous. So God is marvelous. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Just a few quick announcements. Immediately following our morning worship this morning at 11.30 a.m. to 12 p.m., we have our war room prayer line. Amen? Amen. You can call at 605-313-4166 and enter the PIN 10-3330. On Wednesdays at 11 a.m. via Facebook Live or YouTube, join us for our Word Alive Bible study. Amen. We are having a dynamic time. We just started. 1 Corinthians, so this week we will ask that you please read 1 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. Amen. Amen. On September 13th, somebody holler September 13th. September 13th. Thank you, Jeff. We will be celebrating our pastor's 2740 pastoral anniversary. Amen. Amen. He's been 27 years pastor in this block and 40 years of ministry. Amen. We want to be able to celebrate him. So on that Sunday, we have a guest speaker. Uh, Bishop Rudolph Mills will be joining us. And uh, after our service at 12 noon, we are all meeting at Ninth Avenue Park, adjacent to our, uh, our old edifice. And we will be meeting there and driving over at 1215, not 1216, but 1215 to this parking lot and doing a drive-by where you can shower our pastor with your love, your gifts, and just give him an encouraging word because pastoring is not easy. Amen. So we want to be able to celebrate him and acknowledge him and our First Lady for their dedication to this house. Amen. There are various ways that you can give. You can text SB Give to 28950. All those who are here, you can see Brother Ozzy in the back. Praise the Lord. And you can call our church office here at 610-384-2999. Or you can stop by at 857 Lumber Street here in Coatesville, Pennsylvania. At this time, we will have our prayer by Reverend Shirley Tremell. She would come at this time. Amen. Good morning, Saint. Good morning. This is such an honor to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. I've been thinking and thinking and thinking about our, our church family. And I said, Lord, it's time for us to come together. Because whether any of you believe it or not, this thing that's going on in the earth, because it's not just here, you better know that God is trying to get the attention of the people of God as well. And now we have gotten to the place where we use this situation to stay at home. But it's time for us to defeat the enemy and come together. I praise God. I told my pastor, my job didn't close not one day. Not one day. And I ain't no little young girl. The Lord blessed me a few weeks ago to be 73. And I thank God for how he watches over me and keeps me. 
are always teasing me about how I feed people and they call me mom. Well, I done dropped a lot of babies up there. And, and they're not our nationality. I mean, anytime your leaders come to you, why are all these people always hugging and kissing them? Because something you taught me years ago in that basement over there. People are always watching you. Be careful how you carry yourself. Be careful what you allow people to see in and through your life. And I never, ever forgot. So for that same message Daddy gave me, I'm giving it to you. God will give you children that you never even birthed in this earth if you live right. They'll come to you when they need prayer. They'll come to you when they have problems and situations. Not saying that you always have an answer, but God will fill his leaders with what they need to tell others. So let us go before the throne room of grace today. Father God, in the name of Jesus, this is another day that you have awakened us above the dirt. You didn't have to do it, but you did. You woke us up this morning and started us on our way. You breathed the very breath of life in us, giving us food and clothing and shelter, life, health, and strength. There's many among us, Lord, that are sick and that are shut in. But to those of us that have the activity of our limbs and able to get up and praise you and thank you, we come thanking you for what you are about to do. Because we know it's not over until you say it's over. So I come before you, before the throne room of God, asking you that you forgive us of our sins and blot out our transgressions. Forgive us, Lord, this day of all of our iniquities and have mercy upon us according to thy love and kindness and tender mercy. I thank you, Lord, for my beloved pastor today, First Lady, for the entire Smith and Fox family and the entire Second Baptist Worship Center family. It's just been an honor, Lord, to, to be able to come to the house of the Lord. I don't know how anyone else can stay home when they got a chance to come to the house. I, I, I just couldn't wait to get back. And I thank you, God. I thank you. I thank you so much. You should have been blessing me in ways I never dreamed possible. Hallelujah, God. You promised us if we would just give our 10% that you would open doors that no man could shut. And truly, God, you've been opening doors for me. And I thank you and I praise you. But if you did it for me, you'll do it for every one of us that we obey your word. So bless us today as we get ready to go into the word of God. Bless my pastor, God. Uh, stir up the gift in him. Uh, breathe on him, Jesus. I must see God on the Thank you, Jesus. Because no matter what it looks like, the best is yet to come. Because it's not over until God says it's over. Bless us, each and every one. We pray for all of our sick and shut in. Lord, we can stand here and call quite a few names, but Lord, we know who they are. Let us pray for one another and everything that we can do to help one another. Let us be ready to go forth in Jesus' name. We pray and we give thanks. Amen. Reverend Shirley Jamel for that powerful prayer. Amen. At this time, it's almost time to eat. Who's hungry? I'm talking about the spiritual food. All right, now I see you push your hand out. I'm not talking about magic. I'm talking about spiritual food. <laughs> Who's ready to be fed spiritual food? It's about time for the word of God. This is my favorite part of service. Amen. Because this is the part that God speaks to us at any walk or where we are in our life. God speaks to, our, to us. He speaks to 
our spirit, and he gives us the directions that we need to continue on this journey. So I'm so excited to hear the word of God. And I'm excited to just sit and listen to what God has to say to me. I made that personal for me. If, you, if you're ready to listen and hear what God has to say for you, somebody just put your hand on your heart. Be open and willing to receive what God is about to speak to you. Amen? Amen. After this choir comes, this marvelous choir comes and renders us a selection. The next voice you will hear is none other than our pastor, the Reverend Dr. J.
choir, thank you so much for blessing us once again with your presence and your giftedness. Thank you for your grace and for using uh, the gift that God has given to you for his glory. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Are you happy to be here this morning? Come on, don't fool me. Are you really happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Has he done anything so good for you?
you know what? I'm almost inclined to believe somebody came here to worship this song. Somebody came here to Jesus on their mind. Again, I greet you in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our Savior. Uh, it is good to be in this place uh, to worship God and to give his name glory. Uh, this morning, I want, as usual, say a special thanks to all of you who've been consistent and committed to what God has called you to. Amen. And I'm not going to call out any categories this morning. But I just want to openly say before God and all of humanity that Second Baptist is eternally grateful for all that you do and all of your commitment. Amen. For those of you who are at home and who are continuing to view uh, the worship experience, we thank you for your level of commitment and consistency. And we pray that you have been blessed as a result of listening and watching everything that we do in the house of worship. Uh, I do recognize that uh, because of this pandemic, we continue to be on a sliding scale when it comes to worship. Uh, that just means that we're, whereas once we may have been in here, uh, as we used to say, until the spirit comes, but then intellectually, academically, we discovered that the spirit never left us. Theologically, it's a misinterpretation of what the biblical text says because when the Spirit came in the book of Acts in the second chapter, it abode, it stayed with us. He didn't have to leave and come back. He came and resided, took a permanent residence in our lives. Amen, somebody. So for all of us who know the Lord and the Lord knows us, the Spirit of God is here with us because he resides in us. Amen. Amen. Bless God. Uh, I've got a few minutes that I, I want to talk with you uh, this morning, and, and hopefully you won't mind me if I uh, take a look once again at the gospel according to John. You don't have to stand because this is uh, a rather lengthy, difficult text, and so you can relax, but you can read along with me uh, in the text. Steve, if you'll pull that up for me, please. It's coming from John chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 1 through 14. Whenever a preacher gets up to preach, he or she hopes that somehow uh, they might find you where you are. Amen. We have never attempted to design any particular uh, sermon surrounding any individual because it's just not that important. 
There are individuals who assume that we will manipulate a passage of scripture so that we use it to attack somebody. But the truth of the matter is, our task is to hopefully uh, convey a message that won't miss anybody. It's not that the scripture is to be uh, argued, but it is designed to make us better. That's right. And so hopefully in hearing the word of God, all of us become better. Listen to what John has recorded in the life of Christ. The scripture says, after this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Did you hear that? Mm -hmm. Jesus went up on the mountain and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they but so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Can you imagine that? Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their field, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. Don't miss that. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Amen. May God have a blessing to his holy word and sanctify it in our hearts this day. I want to talk to you for just a little while from this thought. Food for the journey. Food for the journey. It has become blatantly obvious that according to this biblical text, there were some things that transpired long before John records what happens with the feeding of the five. You do have to recognize that sometimes when we take a look at the gospel writers, those good news folk, that sometimes it's not necessarily in chronological order. It's not the way it actually happened. Not the time frames are somewhat different. And therefore, the author wants to put certain things in a certain place to draw attention to the event. We discovered in chapters leading up to this point that Jesus has already met at uh, the pool of Siloam. And he has indeed blessed individuals who were lame, blind, and speechless, and individuals who just couldn't do certain things for themselves. Reputation has preceded Jesus because these individuals have discovered that he has some authority to preach and speak unlike anyone else. He is beginning to attract attention from both sides of the Sea of Galilee, from both the side that is infiltrated with the Gentiles and the other side which is filled with the Jewish nation. There is obviously some apparent reason why the authors are writing to suggest to us that there is a pivotal point of the Sea of Galilee as they vacillate from one side to the other. In just a few moments, you're going to discover from this biblical text that Jesus is bridging the gap. 
He's attempting somehow to help humanity understand that God is not so slighted that he's just concerned about the Jews. He wants them to equally understand that God doesn't just love Israel, but he loves all of humanity. And so Jesus moves back and forth across the lake so that somehow he's able to incorporate this magnitude of grace and mercy to absolutely everyone. The people have heard of Jesus' reputation. Some of them have experienced and seen some of his capabilities, and they side it within themselves that they want to draw closer. Now, whether or not Jesus is attempting to get to the other side of the lake, which is about four miles wide to get away from the people, or whether or not he's trying to get to his private prayer ground, we're not absolutely sure. We do know that he was trying his best to get to the other side. Everybody must recognize that we all should have a place that we can call a place where we can get away from the masses so that somehow we can get the undivided attention of the God who creates and keeps. Jesus is no different from any of us. He needed private time to be with God in preparation for the events that he's going to face. You, my brothers and sisters, must recognize that there's going to be some challenges in your own personal life when you are going to need to know that you've already in advance prepared yourself for the predicament that you now find yourself in. Am I talking to anybody this morning? Something suggests to me that there are one or two of you here with me that have experienced some challenging days in your life and in preparation for those challenging days, you recognize that you needed to be in prayer with God in preparation for what was going to happen. And just in case in your own personal life you've not experienced some challenges. Maybe you're too young to come up against any inflictions that may be before you, but trust me, my brothers and sisters, if you live long enough, there's going to be some challenges that you are going to face that you can't seem to handle, that you don't know what you're going to do about it. But if in time presently, you've gone and spent time with God, there's a good chance that in your prayer ground, God will give you strength to get through it. Back to chapter six. The masses have followed, they've gone all the way across the lake because they assume that Jesus has something they need. They have followed and has gotten late in the day. There are sociological problems that are appeared here in the text. For these masses who are in need of concern from the Savior are here and have followed for a great period of time. And now Jesus recognizes that these masses are hungry. I suggest to you this morning that we are living in a time when the masses are hungry. They are hungry for our deliverance from the suffering that seems to be apparent in our nation. If indeed it is not the pandemic, then it is racism that has reared up its ugly head and has caused individuals to seek out some solution for their suffering. And somehow our people are still suffering some 400 years after supposedly having excuse me, some 200 years after supposedly having been delivered from slavery. We indeed recognize that here in this text, Jesus is addressing people who are in need. He approaches Philip and says to Philip, because Philip appears to be quite familiar with the context of where they are. And he asks Philip, is there something here that we can feed these people with? And Philip looks around and he suggests to Jesus that we don't have the wherewithal to feed this amount of people. In this great nation, one of the richest countries in the world, we've got individuals that are standing on our street corners with signs that say they are homeless and hungry. We've got individuals standing on the corners and saying that they are down on their luck in the richest nation in the world. 
Our societal problems are obvious because we've got unemployment in our nation that has skyrocketed like it never has before. Richest nation in the world. The area of academia has seen uh, all of a sudden to take a back seat because now instead of addressing issues early on, we put it off and now we are facing issues like never before. In the greatest nation of the world, we are experiencing a time when our health system is incapable of doing what it could do because for one reason or another, we have decided that if you are not the upper echelon, if you are not in the one percentile, then all of a sudden you do the best you can. Am I talking to anybody this morning? I'm just talking about food for the journey. These individuals were crippled. Some of them were blind. Some of them were lame. And just in case you didn't know it, it can be emblematic of the fact that you may be walking, but you can be sociologically crippled. You may be walking, but you can be psychologically crippled. You may be walking, but financially, you can be crippled. But I suggest to you this morning that according to the biblical text, Jesus has arrived in the midst of the situation and asked Philip point blankly, what can we do about the situation? Philip says, we don't have enough. If we had 200 denarius, we still wouldn't have enough to feed them all. And you can't help but notice there will always be naysayers right. who will suggest that there's not possibly enough revenue to take care of those who are less fortunate. Rather than paying out X amount of dollars to take care of individuals who have paid taxes into our nation, we're busy robbing the retirement plans of other individuals. In the tax. Jesus now moves past Philip because Philip is one of the naysayers, the negative individuals, and he asks Andrew. Andrew, since this is your hometown, since this is somewhere that you are quite familiar with, tell me what can we do about feeding the masses? And Philip takes the initiative to go out and to do a survey and recognizes that there is a young lad who has brought with him five barley loaves and two fish. I said, there's food for the journey. The five barley loaves, barley suggesting that this is a rough type of wheat that is used for those individuals who are impoverished. The barley is the substance that is given to individuals who are not the first or the one percentile or the upper echelon. This is the food that's to sustain the individuals who don't have it all together. Our nation, if in fact we are going to be a great nation, and I don't want to be again. I don't want to be a part of the again. Because the again would suggest that there are nooses again. There are crooked law enforcement officers again. There is second class citizenship again. There are chopping blocks again. I don't want again. I want to be in a nation that recognizes we have the wherewithal to provide our people with everything that they need. I'd like to see crooked Republicans straighten up and recognize that they've got to do some things to help the masses. The word is suggesting that we need food for the journey. Andrew says, we just got five loaves and two fish. Imagine the sight of this, the five loaves and two fish, and the two fish are indicative of the size of fish that we refer to as sardines. 
If the two fish the size of sardines, along with the five loaves, are given in the right place at the right time to the right person, it can be more than enough. They gave the boys lunch, and I know when he left home that morning with his lunch pail, he never thought that when mama put together his lunch, it would be sufficient for more than 5,000 people. I know when he left that morning with his lunch, he thought this was just enough for him to get through his journey. But when you give it to the right person, at the right place, at the right time, God can use it and multiply it and have leftovers. Somebody hears me this morning. Because something tells me that one or two of us have been here when we've not had enough. Some of us have been here and we've experienced some days where the refrigerator was called an ice box. And it was empty. When the cupboard didn't have everything that you needed in it, but mama knew how to make it through. When all you had in the cupboard was a bag of potatoes and some stale bread, and they recognized that you could do something with stale bread and just a little bit of butter and a little bit of sugar and all of a sudden make something out of it. They could take potatoes and stretch it even when they didn't have meat to go with it. Oh, I wish I would have somebody in here that recognizes that there is indeed food for the journey. So you may be hungry this morning for the presence of Christ. All I ask of you is to recognize that he is right before you. Look at the text. For Philip, that suggested that we don't have enough. There's no possible way to do what needs to be done. Andrew says, I found a little boy here. I brought him to you so that he can show you what he has. I suggest to you this morning that you need to reassess who you've brought to Christ. Come on, sir. I need to suggest that biblically the text is warning us to understand that all of us are responsible for making sure that there is somebody you're bringing to Christ. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that if you brought somebody to Christ, they might just become the person who supplies what needs to be supplied to sustain the life of some other folk. Is anybody hearing me this morning? Because if somebody brought you to Christ at some point in your life, you've been a blessing to somebody else. And somebody else as a result of hooking up with you has blessed somebody else. Do you see the multiplication that's happening in the life of the church? When you've been blessed, go and be a blessing to somebody else. I'm just talking about food for the journey. And if you've got some food for the journey, it may look impossible. It may not look like you're going to make it. But God can take that little bit that you have and then give you 12 baskets of leftovers. Now, it is indicative of having a whole basket for every disciple in Israel. If there are 12 tribes in Israel and there's 12 baskets of leftovers, the symbolic nature in the text is to suggest that God's got more than enough to feed everybody on the journey and then have some left over. Now that's a God that's so big, a God that's so rewarding that I want to serve him. And so this morning, I just want to help you to understand that in a hopeless situation, God is saying to you, there's still hope. Even when you don't think you've got enough, God has said, give me what little you got, and I'll make the best out of a bad situation. There is food for the journey. Bless you this day. May heaven smile upon you, and may you recognize that God just wants to bless you. Come on, quiet. Bless us this morning. If, in fact, 
you are in this place and God has spoken to you, God has touched you and would like for you to become a part of this worship center, now is the time to do so. Wherever you are, if you are at home and God has spoken to you, God has tapped you on your shoulder and reminded you that there indeed is food for your journey. It may look impossible, it may look like the trip or the journey is so long that you're not going to make it, but be reassured that the God that we serve is the God that will go with you even to the end. Bless you this day. This is our prayer. Father, we thank you for deliverance. We thank you for your power and presence. And pray that you'll touch our lives in an awesome way. Bless us. Oh, uh -huh. 